So um, Catherine and I have selected, well, there's a pile that's more than five, actually, but we suspect some of them came from the same person and actually we're asking a similar thing. So the questions are on there in their entirety. If we don't have time to get through all five, then we're going to extend the debate online that can carry on beyond the conference over the next days, weeks, months, years, we hope, um, taking a lead from Pat, wherever she's gone, um, in terms of trying to create a, a, a sense of community of practice. It seems that we've hit on something with the online thing. OK, so we'll go through the questions one by one, starting with the top question. Um, we have um, listed the questions as best we can verbatim, but the one that has a pile of three, we've, ab we, we've abbreviated. So I'll try and explain where the context, context came from. So first of all, this actually, I think, leads nicely from Pat was, what Pat was saying. How do we... Stop losing experiences and knowledge. I suppose the kind of experiences and knowledge gained through programmes like Strong Voices. Long known truths resurfacing as new discoveries in youth engagement. Um, that was asked actually by an online participant from Voluntary Arts Southwest, based in Bristol. I hope they don't mind me naming them, but we thought it was a really interesting question. And I think something that a lot of people raise all the time is this issue of nothing's really that new, is it? Um, as, as Catherine said right at the start of the day, what's new is the context that we're all working in and the context that children and young people are now living in. That changes and will continue to change. But actually, the practice, pretty much, um, you know, we can go back 20, 30, 40, probably 100 years and identify good practice. So how do we stop losing that? Um, we can hand it over to the floor, or we can be interested in what Catherine thinks about that. <laughs> um, what, what I think is that there is a danger. It's a paradox, actually, I think, of the internet and the way that we share information, we share learning. That there's almost a danger that because it's easier, in theory, to share knowledge, or to share information anyway, um, we actually process it less effectively because we spend less time reflecting on it. It's going back to Pat's point about the time and space to reflect. So there's a danger of kind of collecting stories and case studies and references and then not living with them and engaging with them in a dynamic way. I mean, I don't know, you know, I have so many piles of paper that are papers from conferences I have attended that are filled with my excited scribbles about all the brilliant things that I've learned and all the people that I want to follow up on and all the new ideas that I want to take on. But then I don't really do it. And so that information doesn't become knowledge for me. And then I lose the thread. And then that whole kind of potential for transformation recedes a little bit. So I think that we, we could find, I think it would be very interesting to find a way of capturing insight and sharing insight more strategically and systematically between people that have common interest in improving particular kinds of practice or investigating particular questions. And, and I think it is absolutely about Pat's time and space point. It's really difficult to do it without time and space. But I think we have to tell stories. I think we have to um, take the time to tell the story about the practitioner of the past or the project next door or the thing that we've seen that is really good instead of just telling the story about our own work because that way we're kind of we're, we're kind of driving it through the system perhaps a bit more systematically but we want to hear what you think about that we, c we are capable of sitting here in silence for quite a long time <laughs> Can you just microphone, microphone. Yeah, can we just wait for the mic, um, just to remind you, so the online audience can hear the debate? Um, I recently read a report that uh, it really chimed with me, what you're saying about these, your reports stacking up, and each time it feels like a revelation, and, and a couple of months down the line, you've forgotten what that revelation was that you were so excited about. But um, a really good report came out recently. Uh, this isn't an answer to that question by any means, but... Um, that came out of King's College and it was looking back over, 
I think it was 60 years, it was looking back since really this, the, the advent of arts in education and it was speaking to sort of key visionaries down the years and a lot of it was anecdotal but it was addressing precisely that, this kind of cyclical nature and, and the way the pendulum swings from one extreme to the other and that we think we're, re and, and that we're regularly reinventing the wheel and so on. Um, but what was really helpful, it was a really, really accessible report. It was written in a very accessible way. And it had just very, very succinct. This isn't a, a way of sharing it widely, but it, it was just drawn to my attention, the particular report. But the way in which it was structured had some very succinct points highlighted right at the outset to say, this is, we've done a, a kind of a survey over however many decades, and this is what's emerged. So that at various, it, it's just a useful thing, I think, at various points to have that very long-term reflection, you know, uh, sort of on a macro kind of scale as opposed to just uh, within individual projects because it, it helped to highlight, for instance, that um, a lot of the progress that might have been, that we perhaps assumed was being made in, in reaching, diversifying young people's, uh, the young types of young people engaged with the arts was not being made and that a lot of that had, rested in the assumption that the school was the key influencer as opposed to the family and that so much more work needed with families because that's where the most progress was like to be made so it was just that came through as a very salient point so that was helpful anyway doing that longer term kind of thing and bringing that back to light thank you does anybody have anything else to say because a, a, a lie oh right no. okay Thank you. Um, I'm just going to make a really a small observation, which I'd be interested in other reflections on. One, what attracts me to working in this sector is the values and the quality that we attend to. I find it really nourishing and I'm grateful for it. I do wonder sometimes whether we forget to tell everybody else. And I think we're really good at collecting information and demonstrating impact, but then we talk to ourselves. And I sometimes think, actually, what we need to be better at is marketing, storytelling, and actually, I've read lots of reports that tell me this is a percentage of people, but what I don't see enough of is this teacher in this school did this amazing piece of work, and as a result of their intervention, really, the human stories that we have are really powerful, and I don't think we share them enough. Mm. Okay. Can I add on to that? Um, I think that's really true, but also, I find that often learning is a, uh, even if it's um, collective learning, collaborative learning, it's often processed individually. So you can have things happen a thousand, a million times, but until it actually happens to you or your organisation, it doesn't actually get processed into real, real learning that has, a, has major impacts. That's what I often find. Um. I just wanted to mention another practical tool, um, the project that you men that mentioned earlier, the Paul Hamlin Foundation Project Circuit, which a number of um, uh, organisations, cultural organisations are involved in. They have a um, communal WordPress site, which essentially appears like a website where um, everyone who's part of the, that national project has access to, and there's no kind of cumbersome editorial process. They can literally use it as a kind of repository for uh, web con for media content, for reflections, for storytelling. Um, and I think we've all found that, I'm a researcher on the project, but I've found that a really useful um, site and space for capturing ongoing learning, um, and hopefully that will then provide a legacy of learning for the projects. It's just another... Um, it's circuit um, and Tate. If you Google that, you it would be really find it. helpful if before you go, you could perhaps pass the links on to Becky and to the King's College report, so that we can share them widely amongst um, the de delegates here today, but also online. If that's help, if people would find that helpful, uh, thank you for that. I think it's is it me? It's me. Um, I'd just like to pick up on what Andrew said because I think it's incredibly true. And if he hadn't said it, I was going to. I mean, the NHS has done studies on how people learn and how you can build practice. And they discovered exactly the same thing, that unless people learn things for themselves, it is quite difficult to change the way things work. So what does that mean for our expectations of the knowledge that we have within the work that we do, given we're all engaged in learning? Are we actually trying 
to do? Are we try is this question trying to solve the right problem? Is there, is there a different way of looking at this that might actually recognise and respect the fact, and I think it is a fact, that people have to process stuff themselves? It's just a thought. I don't know the answer. I think just to add to that really it's just finding an opportunities as quickly as possible to put those experiences and knowledge back into practice i wonder if sometimes we're driven aren't we by funders who constantly ask us for something new so it's almost and, and i agree fully with what virginia and andrew said um, about the, the personal experience but also sometimes we, we're forced to reinvent something and we know we're reinventing something in a new guise just because the funder wants something brand new and I wonder if there's something we can do to, to, to encourage funders not to constantly request brand new stuff but actually to recognise that we're only ever um, recycling ideas and presenting them in different contexts um, and not putting pressure on people to do anything but that because that's the healthiest way of doing things building on learning rather than trying to say that we're going to learn from brand new. And, and I think we tried very hard, didn't we, at, right at the start of Trong, Strong Voices to acknowledge that um, the, the amount of activity that's happening across the country, you know, Strong Voices is just a snippet of it, but how can we build on what we all already knew and had learned? So we got some comments that have come in from the uh, online, um, on the, the online folks. Uh, Juice Festival in North East. Uh, we need to capture and share insight more effectively, tell stories about other people's work as well as our own to improve. Now, that to me sounds a really good idea because I think sometimes we do our own thing but we don't always share other people's stories so I think that adds into the point. Yeah. yeah, really good point. And I think in the arts sector and actually in, in the youth sector too, I think we're probably two of the most open source sectors aren't we you know we don't tend to want to hold everything and keep it to ourselves we do want to share so um, perhaps it is this thing about you know how do we create a community of practice that enables us to recycle more proactively and explicitly um, yeah can I just add a thought um, people who work with me have probably heard me say this about 73 times since I heard it uh, which is a slightly different take on the thing, which is a, a remark made by Sue Hoyle, who uh, runs the Claw Leadership Program. Mm. And she was talking about how to have an impact and how to make change and how to uh, behave in a transformational way. And she said it's possible to make anything in the world happen at all, provided you don't care who gets the credit. And I think that's a very powerful idea which I've been thinking about ever since I heard her say it, because sometimes I think, well, speaking for myself, sometimes the, the sense of frustration or the sense of irritation that something is being presented as new when in fact, you know, we were doing it a hundred years ago and you hadn't even been born and all that. You know, it's actually egotistical. It's not really about advancement of the practice. It's why don't they acknowledge that organization who were so fantastic, who did that thing 30 years ago, and why have they been forgotten? Sometimes it's not like that, but I think it is true that sometimes it is, and particularly in an era of competition and um, a sense of stress around funding and institutions feeling that they need to mark themselves out with a very distinctive USP in order to sustain or secure their funding. There's a paradoxical pressure placed to say, I thought of this, this is my idea, give me the money, you know, it's really, really good. And that goes against the natural flow of knowledge sort of becoming open source by its own account. And, you know, as in folk song, you know, the composer's name falls away after a couple of centuries and you just sing the song anyway, if it's a good song. So I think we need to kind of balance that as well, is, is we want, I would say, we want knowledge and wisdom and insight to circulate so we do our work better. And if it can be attributed in ways that help, great. But actually, if it isn't, maybe that doesn't matter so much either. Thank you. I have the, you, you have I the, have the dipper. Okay, 
So this is a question that we paraphrase. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read the three post-it notes that actually helped us to paraphrase um, the question that, that's in front of you. Who decides what art and what do we mean by quality? Um, please don't sigh. I know it's a debate that's gone on forever, but, but just to provide some context. Um, one of them said, how can we get the highest quality art in everyone's hands? Remember the power of the panto? I remember the power of the panto um, being a veteran Blackpool Children's Pantomime member for 10 years. Um, and how can we balance doing young people-led work with the need to expand young people's awareness of the full range of arts and culture on offer to them, allowing them to find out about things they don't yet know they could love? They can only think from what they already know when we ask, what would you like to do? So it's this thing about, we only know what we know. So it's, it's that balance of how do we consult young people and ask them what they want to do without be, be, being beholden to only giving them what they ask for, I suppose. Um, so, so the question in front of you can be answered or you can think about the, the three post-it notes and, what, um, and anything that they presented to you that may be different. Just one thing, when we were talking about this, we were thinking about, never forget the power of the panto, we were thinking about popular culture mm -hmm. and we were thinking about there is a kind of sometimes a default assumption that um, engaging people in arts and culture, and it's not just young people, needs to be somehow other than the things that people might actually just want to do. And I think this is, this is kind of an interesting paradox in that, and we're, 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 we're sort of straddling some bridge between things that are very good for you and things that are really fun, and trying to make one be the other all the time. And maybe, yeah, maybe we over-control was what we got yeah, to. Yeah. Maybe there's you know, a sense of over-controlling sometimes. And, and how far do we equate high, high art with high quality? And should we be doing that? Because actually, my panto experience was, uh, uh, you know, I learned discipline, I learned social skills. Um, it was superb high quality. It was in a professional theatre, uh, working with professional technicians, having the full experience. But it was fairly low art in the scheme of things. So uh, it created some debate between myself and Catherine, and so we thought that it would create a similar kind of debate. Amongst we hoped. Yourselves. We hoped. Yes. We lived in hope. Yeah. Oh. Becky, there's one here as well. Hello. Uh, sorry, it's Anthony from A New Direction. We've been working on the Strong Voices program as well. It's one of the questions that's come up with us um, quite a lot as well. And I think one of the things that we've started to, to really think about and, and what we're building up towards is really the idea that. Um, Asking this question is just important. We know that we're not necessarily going to get the answer. Um, but also recognising that whenever we make decisions, they're not necessarily neutral. So all the decisions that we make and about all the young people that we want to work with, they're never going to be a neutral decision. You're, somebody's always um, having to either give over or relinquish power. And the important thing is either deciding, do you do that? Do you let young people decide what they want to do? What kind of cultural activities they want to do? Or do you do that as an organisation and make some decisions, decisions for them? And I still don't think there's a wrong or a right, uh, a right way about doing that. Um, the other thing that's probably really interesting is that we know from our research that young people don't really talk about arts and culture. I think people know this generally, but young people talk about creative activities. And actually, it's also really important, I think, for us to remember that arts and culture is something we all talk about because we're funded by the Arts Council. Um, but actually, young people don't really have a sense of that in their day-to-day -day lives. It's not how they engage with um, kind of the creative stuff that they do. Um, yeah, I... When I was involved in, um, directly in um, youth arts work in, in a city, Leeds, in the... Well, I won't tell you which decade, because that would date me. Um, but... It seemed to me the critical thing was actually about um, offering range and choice to young people. Not, and that one of the difficulties at the moment is that 
there simply isn't. In many places, there isn't range and choice. There's either um, straightforward responding to what, child, what young people want, which is absolutely fine, and some of that might be really high quality, some of it may not be high quality, but there, are no, there, there aren't the kind of progression routes that some of the Strong Voices network have been exploring. And by progression routes, I don't mean, you know, start off DJing and end up doing opera, which I think is what some concepts of progression routes are, but that, that we need to be offering range, choice, complexity, and working out how we can, how we can offer that within a particular community. And um, I, had the, I had the good chance of um, hearing Ken Robinson speak yesterday at a memorial lecture for Anna Craft, who's been very influential in the field of creativity in early years. And he was talking about um, the need for judgment. You know, that we're always making choices and I think that ties in uh, with what Anthony was saying, that there's no right or wrong answer to this. It's, it's about making a judgment in the circumstance with a particular group of young people in terms of opening up opportunities to them for them. Um, I think uh, asking young people, consulting with what they were asking, what they want to do is great. We start from there, but I think we're forgetting the fact that young people are also very inquisitive so they don't stay in the same place and once you begin from a, a journey then they, they will find their own paths and they'll find new ways and they'll, they'll move on from what, what they originally started from I wouldn't worry about the point you start from <laughs> hello um, I'm Jenny I'm from part of the strong voices team I think something that I personally feel very passionately about is that we should create environments for people to choose not to do something after they have experienced or accessed doing that. So I did ballet when I was younger. I'm very, very uh, lucky to have a family that could support me to access ballet class. I am not, you would be shocked to find out, <laughs> a professional ballet dancer. I don't do ballet at all. What's important, I think, is that I had access to a ballet class and that I thought, actually, I don't want to do this anymore. And I made an informed decision to not do ballet anymore. Now, from a programme point of view, that's often quite difficult and challenging because a positive outcome for a project isn't for me to turn around and say, yes, thanks very much, but I, I will not do ballet ever again. So I, th I, I appreciate the complexities of that from a programme planning point of view and from an evaluation point of view. But I think we should also be aware and really celebrate the informed choices that our young people make when they say, no, that's not what I want to do, but I have accessed it and I've made an informed choice because of that. I suppose that comes down to the quality question then, doesn't it? Because for me and in my experience, what worries me is that often it's the poorest children and young people that get the rawest deal. So um, the kind of community offer that sometimes exists doesn't allow for the progression that could have been available to mm. you, even though you didn't cho yeah. choose to take it. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, dance is a really good example, I think, because we have um, young people whose parents can't afford to send them to the private ballet lessons, often swirling around this vortex of provision that doesn't take them anywhere. They can go to the same cl dance class for months and months and years and years without improving their skills beyond what that class provides. And I think that's an issue that the, the poorest kids get the rawest deal, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to art forms that often, you know, if you want to, to, to reach the higher echelons in, and, and go to study in a conservatoire, for, for example, it's unlikely you would ever get that opportunity for all you'd ever done, even if you'd done it for years and years, is attend a community dance class. Yeah. Absolutely, and I agree. And I think the, the, the main thrust of um, my consideration is around access. It is about first point access to it being a quality experience and that we have a responsibility to provide access so that a young person can say, brilliant, thanks very much, not for me, but I actually would love to do this other thing that I also have access to over here. And that is the challenge, particularly yes. for those who, who haven't got that, that first yeah. point access. Yeah. I think there was somebody behind, Becky. I'm Steph, I, I'm from Norfolk and Norwich Festival Bridge, um, but I'm going to talk on behalf of my other colleagues from the Eastern Region, the Royal Opera House Bridge, who have done some really interesting research with young people recently, which you can find on their website, uh, which says very clearly that young people don't think in terms of art form anymore. 
they muck it all up. They, they do dance and a bit of ballet and a bit of street, and then they mix it up with a bit of filmmaking, they do a bit of photography, and then they might do some graphic art on the top, and they might do some beatboxing, and it all fits in one thing in their brain. They, don't, they, they, they aren't looking at making decisions about, I'm going to do this, not that. They're making decisions which say, I'm going to do all of it. I'm just going to do a little bit of all of it. And I think for us, especially with some of us who have targets around... Um, that are given to us by Arts Council where things are very, very clearly boxed into particular art forms. It's a real challenge for working with young people at the moment because their view of what art looks like isn't necessarily ours anymore and isn't necessarily our funders. And that's an interesting thing. But it's a, the, the findings of that, um, that consultation with young people, it's called You Ask, We Answer, and it was with the audience agency, and you can find it on the Royal Opera House Bridge website. It's there now. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll send a link to that. I'm sure colleagues that in the Royal Opera House will be pleased for us to do that. But it is that, you know, that, that sense of perhaps young people are carving their own pathways now and they might not even need us. Um, wouldn't that be a good situation to be in? Uh, anybody else on this question of quality, perhaps? That's something we haven't addressed. Or is that, an, is that a debate we don't I'd, want to get I'd into? I'd like to just pick back up off the back of what Steph said um, and I've noticed that particularly in, in discussing this point we have been talking about young people as if they're a homogenous group who, who will or won't do this or that or want to do this or that and we all know of course that as humans that you know they're not any more than we are a homogenous group but I think I'm just wondering about the whole notion of provision and offer, which is also a language set that I've struggled with for 30 years, because it, it feels so sort of supermarket-based to me. It feels so consumption-based rather than experience-based and relationship-based. And I, I wonder if, the, for, for me, the, the thing that kind of provides the join between the question of quality and the question of populism and high art and low art and art and all of those things is about relationship and experience. So if, if we are facilitating experiences or facilitating relationships in which um, whoever the people are, young people, staff, older people, who, whoever we're working with, are able to do what Jenny's done, have an experience of something in it and make, have a judgment about that or um, do what perhaps the young people who filled in the Royal Opera House survey have done, which is go, I'll have a bit of this and a bit of this and a bit of this and great, and now I'm going to go do something else. I wonder why we mind, and I think we mind because we have an idea in our mind about progression. I don't think it's really about quality and I don't think it's really about art. I think what we're really thinking about is what you were saying, is we're thinking about are we giving somebody the opportunity to grow and develop, and that then you get into the territory of is it educational, is it developmental, or is it, quote, just fun? So we have these ideas that if something is fun, we might not progress in it. Mm -hmm. And then what we try and do is make the things that we think will give us the opportunity to progress more fun. And then it, it all becomes a bit of a mess and a bit of a muddle. But if, if we think about it the other way around and think, what do these people we happen to be describing as young want to do and what is interesting and motivating and stimulating and inspiring and then how do we as people who are not those individuals contribute to that journey information challenge dialogue discussion resources advocacy signposting forgiveness space time all the things that we need as humans to progress then I think the choice making and the judgment making really is in the hands of people participating and so that the debate, going back to the funder point, then, then the reflection back to the funder is simply about the funding system not being fit for purpose and entirely anachronistic and needing to change. But the evidence base then can come from participants themselves. It was a bit rambling, mm -hmm. but it's what I'm thinking in this moment. Yeah, and, and I suppose for me, it then brings up the issue of young people who don't always have the self-efficacy yeah. to join the things without having somebody behind them yeah, support giving and guidance. support and, and guidance, which is a whole other debate, I suppose. Mm. Thank you. Shall we move on to the next question? Just looking at the time. Do for, do for, do for. Oh, do for, do for. 
I shouldn't be left in control of the doofer. Um, now this, uh, how do young people want to be addressed? This was a debate we had right at the start. For those of you who have been involved with Strong Voices right from the start, I think we spent probably a whole afternoon talking about what do we call young people? Because obviously all the way through the guidance for this funding part, we, were, we, we reflected back the language that the Department for Education used, which was the most disadvantaged and vulnerable young people. Well, actually, are we labelling young people? Is that, are those, are those the right terms to use? In fact, we've, we've continued to use those terms, um, but for me, it doesn't really single out any young person. Show me a young person that isn't vulnerable at some point in their young lives or adolescence. So, um, really, it's, it's over to you. How do you, you know, young people in the room, um, this might be a good one for you. How do we refer to young people without perhaps labelling them or, or causing no, more damage through... Um, pigeonholing young people into certain types of groups, I suppose. It's um, a contentious one. It became contentious, if I remember. K Kelly, do you have a... I know that you have a lot to say about this. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting, and I think it's a debate that we've had a lot of the time. Um, and I, I would... My feeling about language and being careful around language is if you intend to offend or belittle someone, you will do that. And if you don't, you're most infinitely less likely to do it. Um, I don't have... I know other people um, don't like the term disadvantaged, but for me, um, it's out of all the terms that are thrown around, actually disadvantaged is factual. You are disadvantaged by society. If you say vulnerable, you're talking about the person themselves and it's a judgment on them and how they are in some ways. It could be interpreted like that. But I think disadvantaged is all our responsibility. It isn't just the responsibility of one person. I'm disadvantaged by being a woman in some circumstances. You know, we all have disadvantage in different parts of society in different roles that we play. So I think it's, it's acquired this air of being derogatory, and I don't see it as being derogatory, I see it as being factual and all our responsibility. So if it could lose that air, I would be much more comfortable with it. But it, for me, it feels like the right term, especially when we've talked about social models of disability, for example, as opposed to other models. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, it's an it'll be interesting to hear what other people have got to say, because it never sits perfectly comfortably. Yeah, just don't take my speech. Hello, I'm trying to find it in 10. What I would say from my experience is in other organizations as soon as what I would say, don't, don't, don't go in there when you're feeling these young people with, with any big conceived ideas, let, let, let them worry about their problems themselves because if, if you flag, flag them up straight away, you know, it comes, comes, um, you, you can sort of sense them from the young peasant perspective that's not what you want to hear from, you know. So, so what, what I would say is don't put, put any, don't have any pink conception about the young people before you meet them. Because the things that are personal around disability are, are personal to the young people. It's not for, for you to worry, worry about, you know. So when you're thinking about empire, Find somebody. Don't let them talk to you about things. Don't have any sorry going on. So, uh, 
<laughs> Thank you, anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you... Um, we used to, my experience of uh, trying to interpret how young people want to be addressed and being sensitive to um, how they might, you know, be, be insulted by however they were being categorised was uh, we used to run a programme in Birmingham called Gallery 37 and um, it was a training programme that prioritised bringing young people 16 to 24 to work with um, professional artists for four weeks during the summer. And we prioritised certain groups um, for access to that um, programme, but everybody had to come for an interview. And we would tip, uh, we generally had about 100 young people, up to 200 at its peak each summer for, um, for four weeks. And we would interview them at the outset, and we had to make clear that the context of this interview was not just try and impress us with you know, your achievements, because we knew that we had priority groups that had to do with, if you've been excluded from school, you're probably likely to be a higher priority. But we would tiptoe around these issues in the interview context, but equally we'd need to make it clear that you know, those barriers or those challenges that you might have faced might in this instance actually be an advantage for getting onto the programme. So we would be as careful and diplomatic as we could about this. And nine times out of ten, young people saw straight through it, knew exactly what they were being categorised as, yeah. knew what an advantage it served as, and not exploited it exactly, but were quite happy that in this instance, you know, I'm just, this is just my experience in this particular context, that in this instance, okay, it's working to my advantage, I'll go with that for this particular opportunity that I'm being afforded. So, again, it, it, it is about not making assumptions in, in some instances that they'll automatically be hypersensitive to how they're being addressed, and it depends on the context as well as the young person, I think. Have any Strong Voices colleagues experienced any kickback from young people? Um, who may have heard that strong voice is about is about them being disadvantaged and vulnerable. Um, some of the young people that I've supported on the work-based learning elements of strong voices, we've had to have um, really tricky conversations, exactly similar, really similar to what you've just described, in terms of if they were to be used as a case study for the strong voices program, what does that mean to them? And, and how they are then perceived by people that, that see that information. And it, it really kind of polarised their responses. Um, I had one young man who didn't want to be associated as being vulnerable or disadvantaged in, in any way because he was an artist and very much wanted to be, to be viewed as such and didn't want to have that kind of label, so to speak, attached to him. But then I had another young person who on kind of reflecting and taking time to discuss it, saw it as an opportunity for her to be a role model to other young people in a similar situation to the one that she just found herself in. So it can really, it, it can really polarise them and it can really, it really, as you exactly said, it depends on the individual and on their circumstances and how they want to move forward with their career and their lives as to, as to how they do want to be addressed and kind of shouted about I suppose and that goes back to what the young man was saying about don't have any preconceived ideas um, your approach Holly was to actually ask them yeah. um, I just wanted to add something uh, we <laughs> at Juice Festival um, have had a documentary film made of our school's programme last year um, and one of the young people from Cedars Academy who took part in a visual arts project um, and had his work displayed at the Baltic, uh, was interviewed for the film. And I just found it interesting what he said in his interview. And I can't get it verbatim, but I'll try my best. It was something like, um, it's really great and it's really important to show what special needed young people can do with their artwork. Um, and I just wanted to share what he'd said. Um, in uh, the North East, I think we had a conversation early on about how visible strong voices needed to be in the lives of the young people that we had funding to work with and whether that was needed or not. 
um, because there are so many short-term funded projects and programs whereby there are starts and end points for young people who already have an incredible amount of starts and end points in their lives would we need to be another organisation in their life? And we made the decision uh, quite early on that we would largely um, add value to the organisations who are already working with them and that the funding wouldn't necessarily need to be hugely visible to the young people. It would be the activity and the, uh, the programme of work that they would be involved in. And it's not to say that... Um, that we haven't addressed the term vulnerable and disadvantaged, but what we've done is we've had that dialogue with the organisations and we've said, what support do you need to work with young people who have different context in their lives and how can we support you? But we're, we've been less visible to the young people because they have a lot of organisations and people already in their lives and, and we didn't want to just be another one that would come to an end because I think that happens too, too often. Good point. Is there anything coming from our online audience? Shall I move on? No, no, no. So this is another biggie. Yes, Catherine's um, learned that I don't control the diva very well. <laughs> I've, I've clicked it. Um, what's our role in addressing child poverty? And when, when we read this question, I suppose the, day, the, the first thing we said to each other was, is it our role to address child poverty? Um, or are we um, trying to do, provide activities that will counter the symptoms of child poverty? Um, because it's a huge ask, isn't it? You know, I think government after government have tried to address, eradicate child poverty and haven't managed it. So how can um, us, as mere arts and youth practitioners, um, try to do the same thing? So a big question but uh, um, one that we thought would create some debate. Uh, I guess I'm sharing um, an example of a project that um, we've worked on. I work with Helix Arts in Newcastle um, that was using the arts, I guess, as a tool to try and address that exact question, uh, child poverty. A group of young people worked with live theatre um, and uh, children North East, and they stood exactly on that stage that you're sat on to a group, a conference, a bit like this, with a lot of, uh, it was a big campaigning project for children North East, so there was a lot of people in the room who were coming from right across the country who had influence in trying to, I don't know if I can use the word eradicate child poverty, but certainly address and change uh, circumstances and, and how it might, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, they used theatre and it was an opportunity them, for them to voice their thoughts and their feelings on being a young person who was living in poverty. And I think for them, the feedback we got was not only was that a really enjoyable experience, the workshops they had, um, the way in which the young people who were, came through Children North East were able to work with young people who were already in a young people's project with live theatre. Um, that was a really exciting and different experience for everybody involved. But to be able to stand on that stage knowing that the people sat in our positions here had some influence and they were able to tell them what they thought and what they thought would be better. I just, I was really inspired and um, it, yeah, it's just maybe one way of many. So I just wanted to start it off with something like that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention, I suppose we've heard a lot from um, those involved in Strong Voices um, that they've identified a kind of poverty of youth provision um, regionally. So I'm wondering whether the role isn't perhaps how do you address child poverty, but how do you address your role in relation to youth services and the youth sector and support structures for dealing with child poverty. So I just wondered whether there's anyone who's been part of Strong Voices who might be able to speak to that, sort of what is the responsibility of a programme like this to defend, collaborate with 
the youth sector on a national level to lobby potentially for youth services um, or potentially replace them where provision is absent. Anybody, want, anybody from the Strong Voices teams want to address that, Kelly? Yeah. Um, I very much agree that one of the things we certainly found in, um, in our project is that the cuts to, youth, cuts to youth services dramatically affect this kind of work because you know, mo a lot of arts organisations turn first to youth sector organisations when we're doing this kind of work because you have to have an existing relationship with the group. We need your expertise to do this kind of work, so we all feel those cuts, I think. Um, and we've definitely felt them through this programme, as Pat alluded to before, you know, people disappearing in the middle of projects really affects the work. It's a huge thing, so I do think we have a role. Um, and I do think we have a role to work much closer together. Um, and how we do that, um, isn't entirely clear and it's a difficult conversation to have at a time when we know that you know the youth sector is suffering lots of cuts but we want to talk to you more um, and we don't do that enough we don't go to each other's events so which is why I'm so pleased that there are people here from the youth sector today so um, any suggestions you've got let's talk more let's work out how we do this better together um, so yeah I don't have an answer but I totally agree that it's incredibly important <laughs> Okay, I've got a uh, comment from the, okay. sorry, okay. just thought I'd jump That's, in, thanks, um, from the online about the child poverty, um, from Di Cumming, child poverty is a political issue, the arts can and should address political issues, so yes, artists and art, arts organisations can address political issues with their audiences and participants. Good point. Thank you. I just wanted to add, because um, we also worked a lot with youth organisations in London with A New Direction, and we saw our role there very much in bringing them together for the action research, and it really did enable them to focus on professional development. So not only did we offer um, CPD opportunities, but we also brought people together to talk about the strengths in the arts practice that they were um, encountering and also the strengths in the youth sector. And over two years, the, the organisations involved found that their capacity had grown massively because they were enabling staff at, who were previously unable to do certain things to manage projects to learn how budgets work and to really grapple with issues that perhaps they hadn't as a youth sector um, planning meetings collaboration um, consultation all of all of the things that perhaps some of the youth workers we were working with hadn't done before so giving them those skills enabled them as organizations to do those things in the future and then another thing just to signpost is the um, the research that AND has done into child poverty and young people on free school meals specifically has shown that young people on free school meals are less likely to engage in arts and culture so that is something that we should all be aware of and addressing. Naturally a lot of the research is that young people um, in situations of poverty benefit the most from arts and cultural intervention as well. Sorry Pat, it was this lady behind you first of all, sorry with the mic. Hi, I'm Ali Walton from Headway Arts. I just wanted to pick up on the idea of poverty because I think um, poverty breeds all kinds of other poverty. Poverty of aspiration, poverty of ambition, poverty of choice. And I think the, what we can do to address that is to offer, offer, do what we do basically. So offer choice and offer aspiration within our projects. Um, I think we assume as a sector sometimes that art is, um, as important to young people as it is to, to us. A lot of the young people I work with wouldn't necessarily um, think that art was something that was really important to their lives and wouldn't necessarily recognise that art could do anything for them. And that's, that's kind of what I want to throw in there is that I think having, having a poverty of aspiration or a poverty of understanding what opportunities can be there is something that we can do something that we really can act on okay. um, I think um, two things that we know from find your talent and some research that was carried out under the auspices of, of CCE that when there's more of an investment in the arts um, it's the people who are already doing it and who are already quite privileged that, that pick it up. And I don't think we did that in Strong Voices, specifically because we worked with um, youth and community organisations who were 
embedded in communities and not just geographic communities but communities of interest but I think as a as a movement if that's what we're going to become there is that thing about equity and people who have access to power will continue having access to power and will go and get what they want for their children um, and I think I think we have got a responsibility I, I take the point that you know, this is in a very complex discussion and what, what is it that young people want, but um, I think we have to acknowledge that we are working in a situation where um, it, the, the provision is not equitable. Um, and I just wanted to po point to one piece of research that came through some of the work in particularly one particular Strong Voices area, which actually is kind of blindingly obvious but hadn't occurred to me which is that when uh, cultural organisations do their bookings online, they don't actually have any idea of who it is that's, that's picking up their, their provision. So that when you start talking to them about working, diversifying the, the, the groups of people that they're working with, they don't actually have the data to know who their audiences are in, the, in, in terms of the kinds of young people that we're talking about they don't know who they're providing for. Yes, we need to, to wrap it up now. Thank you. Um, we're not going to make the last question, but the last question, along with all of the other questions that were in the question box, will be posted on Twitter, or is there somewhere else, Becky, that it's going to be put? Will it be? We'll, 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 we'll tweet them, and, and please continue the debate. The word for the day, the word of the day for me overridingly is hope. Thank you, Julie. Um, and I think the, the, the level of debate and the level of passion and commitment to this agenda gives us all that, that thing that, that it is most in Julie's triangle, which is, is hope. So thank you. Um, we'll walk away as Strong Voices as a funded programme ends, but, but certainly I think Pat's right. I think what we need to do now is, is gather the momentum and create a movement out of this. So thank you for Great. being part of the debate. So all that's left is to say goodbye. I shall stand up to say goodbye because I'm not very good at sitting <laughs> down. Um, we've really enjoyed having you here at Sage Gateshead and we've really enjoyed having you as the guest of the Strong Voices Consortium and it's been very exciting for those of us who've been embedded in the programme for two years, slightly obsessively probably, uh, to share it with other people and get your responses and reactions and it's been great to have people joining us online and giving us their responses and reactions and the, one of the many questions we didn't t take out of the box but that will be shared with you of course was the question about short termism and how do we manage this um, really unsatisfactory situation of of being able to spend a short amount of time investigating and creating something that really just needs to be how life is, that needs to be part of the ordinary flow and churn of, of how we live in our communities, that arts and cultural experiences are part of the rich mix of what we do to be a community. And so I guess the, the thought I'd love you to take away is the thought, how do I connect, how do I collaborate, and how do I create in the places that I am, so that the short-termism might be located around this particular funding mechanism and the particular collection of activities that we called Strong Voices, but that there could be nothing short-term at all about what you do in your communities, in your professional communities and your personal communities that advances the mission of the work and takes the learnings from the work into new places to do new things because then it isn't short term if you take it with you and do something with it. Um, very practically, we'll be making a, a kind of web portal legacy of all the learnings and the case studies and reports and all kinds of things, which in due course, you will be sent links to so that you've got all of that and can access it and share it. But most important is you take it away as a sense of renewed energetic purpose in your own heart to take the work forward in your own place. Thank you.
And we have to thank all of the people that are standing at the back of the room who've done a huge variety of things, including the one that's sitting down, which is Katie, <laughs> there, without whom there would be certainly no conference, and um, without Katie there would have been no programme either. So let's <laughs> thank them. And you are now free to go. Thank <laughs> you.